In this second part of our lecture on Charlotte Perkins Gilman's The Yellow Wallpaper, I want to situate the story within the wider culture of Victorian feminism and its responses to consumerism and issues of female work and labor during the period. In previous lectures, we've discussed the ideology of separate spheres, which positioned women in the domestic space rather than the public sphere, which was um, exclusively the domain of men. Um, separate spheres put women in the domestic space, but it also positioned them as consumers rather than producers. During this period, it was the norm that middle class and upper class women did not work outside of the home. This didn't mean they didn't participate in the economy, however. Women were the primary consumers during this period, purchasing everything that they, their children, and their husbands needed with the money that their husbands earned. That middle and upper class women were seen as society's primary consumers during the end of the 19th century is made clear in Tanya Piccola's work on the subject. She writes that advertisers recognize housewives as primary agents of material consumption is perhaps best reflected in the establishment of 48 ladies' magazines in the period between 1880 and 1900, which consisted in large part of advertisements. Bram Dykstra, in his influential book Idols of Perversity, has also noted the association between women and consumption during this period, writing, Thus, woman having been consumed in the marriage market, then having become consumptive as a wife through lack of respect, exercise, and freedom, took her revenge by becoming a voracious consumer. We've already seen some of these ideas in our consideration of Carmilla, in which the upper class was painted as leeches upon society, absorbing the labor and capital of the working people who actually produced goods and provided services. This metaphor of the upper class as vampires or leeches upon the rest of society was quite easily extended in the late Victorian period to all women, kept first by their fathers and then by their husbands, spending but never earning. In her feminist call to arms, Women and Labour, the writer Olive Schreiner therefore deemed women parasites for this reason. Schreiner writes, again and again in the history of the past, when among human creatures a certain stage of material civilization has been reached, a curious tendency has manifested itself for the human female to become more or less parasitic. Social conditions tend to rob her of all forms of active, conscious, social labor and to reduce her, like the field tick, to the passive exercise of her sex function alone. And the result of this parasitism has invariably been the decay in vitality and intelligence of the female, followed after a longer or shorter period by that of her male descendants and her entire society. In the previous video on the yellow wallpaper, we saw that the gender ideology of the Victorian period reduced women to nothing but a body, something to be fed in exchange for sex and babies. Schreiner suggests that this reduction of women to their biological functions renders all women on the same level as prostitutes. All women are, in some form or another, selling their bodies in order to support themselves. Then, in place of the active, labouring woman upholding society by her toil, has come the effete wife, concubine or prostitute, clad in fine raiment, the work of others' fingers, fed on luxurious viands, the result of others' toil, waited on and tended by the labour of others, the need for her physical labour having gone and mental industry not having taken its place. She bedecked and scented her person, or had it bedecked and scented for her. She lay upon her sofa or drove or was carried out in her vehicle, and, loaded with jewels, she sought by dissipations and amusements to fill up the inordinate blank left by the lack of productive activity. Finely clad, tenderly housed, life became for her merely the gratification of her own physical and sexual appetites and the appetites of the male, through the stimulation of which she could maintain herself. And, whether as kept wife, kept mistress, or prostitute, she contributed nothing to the active and sustaining labours of her society. She was the fine lady, the human female parasite, 
the most deadly microbe which can make its appearance on the surface of any social organism. Important in this passage is Schreiner's focus on material goods, sofas, vehicles, jewels, perfume, dresses. It's these goods that women trade their bodies for. Now, this might seem to the modern reader to be a rather misogynistic attack on women, and particularly on sex workers, treating them as greedy and materialistic. But Schreiner's point is that it's society that's made all women into parasites. They have been barred from earning their own living, made entirely dependent upon men, and therefore transformed into objects and commodities themselves, a way for a father or a husband to display his own success by decorating her body with costly jewels or fabric. In the critical chapter I asked you to read alongside the yellow wallpaper for this week, Dara Downey argues that Perkins Gilman engages directly with this construction of ideal womanhood in order to challenge the social systems that reduce women to this parasitic state. Therefore, rather than reading the haunted house as a metaphor for the haunted mind, as we often do in Victorian Gothic stories, Downey focuses on the home's status as an embodiment and agent of domestic ideology. She argues, the story depicts decorative objects not as proof of feminine frivolity, vanity, or superficiality, but as active and malevolent agents in a harmful domestic system, imprisoning women in a gilded cage. Here, agent means something that has agency, something that is capable of acting upon another. The house is not merely background, not merely setting. It embodies the separate sphere's ideology which imprisons women to the home, and it embodies the culture of material consumption which branded women as materialistic, frivolous, and vain, lacking the intellectual capabilities of their male counterparts. Perkins Gilman's point, Downey argues, was that the middle-class home in Gilded Age America was by no means a benign institution, and that claiming otherwise was both erroneous and pernicious. Combining sexual companionship, child-rearing, and economic dependence, the 19th century middle-class American home turned women into slavish drudges and men into selfish tyrants. She continues, Gilman insisted that women needed financially and personally rewarding work outside of the home in order to free them from their restricting and damaging condition as unpaid, unskilled house servants, personal shoppers, and legally sanctioned prostitutes. And this is precisely the argument that Schreiner makes in Women and Labour as well, and an argument that continues to be relevant today. It's not that housewives do no work, it's that they do work that's not given economic value and thus is rendered invisible, forcing them to demonstrate that they are earning their keep in other ways. And both Schreiner and Downey point to the sexual part of that bargain, which suggests that a husband is absolutely entitled to his wife's body whenever he wants it, because he has, in essence, paid for it. The main thrust of Downey's article is that she wants us to look beyond the individual circumstances depicted in Perkins Gilman's story. Obviously, not all women were placed on rest cure the way Perkins Gilman was, to consider the wider systems which sanctioned the oppression that our narrator and that Perkins Gilman herself faced. Thus, Downey argues, her postnatal depression is a symptom of her inability to adjust to a role that culture insists is natural to women, as well as an externalization of her refusal to do so. She is ill not only because culture automatically inserts her into a pattern where she does not fit, but also because she resists the insertion. Here we can see Downey using the gender theory of Judith Butler, who in Gender Trouble insisted that gender was not a biological reality, but rather a social script that we're unable to escape. The part of woman is a role that society expects women to act without ever having signed up for the play. By focusing on these roles or scripts that women are forced to play out, Downey therefore turns our attention from individuals to systems. Thus, she insists that we should not read the wallpaper as a mere symbol of the narrator's psychic breakdown, but as an active agent in that breakdown. In other words, it's not relegated to a purely symbolic role, but taken seriously as a very material part of the domestic system the story critiques. 
The wallpaper, Downey argues, represents not our narrator's crumbling hold on sanity, but rather the systems and beliefs that have broken her. Thus, Downey directs our attention to the pattern at the heart of the wallpaper, saying, it is not so much the superficial it is not so much the supernatural appearance of women emerging from the pattern in ordinary wallpaper that frightens the narrator, or even the dread that they might succeed in doing so. Instead, she is profoundly disturbed that they cannot escape, that the pattern is stronger than they are. The implication is that countless women are simultaneously experiencing both the violence of gender ideology and the difficulties of refusing its demands, forming a vast socio-cultural web of oppression. Now I want to turn to some of those webs of oppression that women at the end of the 19th century began to push back against by looking at the figure of the new woman. At the end of the 19th century, the new woman emerged in both Britain and America. This new woman sought to challenge the systems that entrapped women into domestic and maternal roles by challenging laws and social customs alike. The caricature of the new woman was exactly what someone like Henry Maudsley worried women were becoming by being too intellectual. They were mannish. So the new woman is often marked out in kind of negative portrayals of her by these features, by wearing trousers, which were of course at that point only meant for men, by riding a bicycle, a sign of personal autonomy and freedom, by wearing glasses, which mark her out as engaged in intellectual pursuits, as do books, and by smoking cigarettes, which again was a masculine behaviour that women were not supposed to engage in. These caricatures paint women in a very bad light. So according to someone like Grant Allen in his Plain Words on the Woman Question from 1889, the new woman is unsexed and therefore barren. And again, we see the medical ideas of Henry Maudsley coming through here, that By turning away from more feminine pursuits, she actually loses her femininity. She loses her ability to reproduce. So Grant Allen suggests that the new woman wants to give up men entirely, to therefore live chastely, forgo motherhood, and doom the species to instant extinction. Barry Williams, who, like Grant Allen, was a critic of the new new woman, um, writes, What are the rights of woman? What is the program to be fulfilled? Is a change coming over the ideal of marriage or is another springing up by its side? And are women to insist on a separate maintenance, on competing with their husbands in the labour market and on exchanging partners with the freedom allowed in some districts of Germany and certain of the United States? So here Williams has two concerns, which are both really about... um, the stability of masculine identity rather than the stability of feminine identity, right? He thinks women moving out of the domestic sphere into the public sphere is a direct challenge upon the rights of men. They're going to compete with their husbands in the labor market. This suggests that unlike what Maudsley argued in the previous video, that women are not actually inferior, right? That they will pose some serious competition to husbands. The worry is that men will not be able to keep up with women in the labor market. Um, And equally, the idea that women would be able to choose their own sexual partners takes away what Williams believes to be the rights of man, the right of men to do the choosing and women to submissively take it. The idea, again, really shows the sense of inferiority in men at this time. If a woman has the freedom to choose, Barry Williams is very clear that he doesn't think they're going to choose him. Grant Allen also considers what this possible program of female education and female empowerment might look like. I am writing that... At the present moment, a great majority of the ableist women are wholly dissatisfied with their own position as women, and with the position imposed by the facts of the case upon women generally, and this as the direct result of their false education. They have no real plan to propose for the future of women as a sex, but in a vague and formless way they protest inarticulately against the whole feminine function in women, often even going the length of talking as though the world could get along permanently without wives and mothers. 
Here, Grant Allen positions women not as this dangerous, unsexed being who might take all the rights um, and liberties of man, but as an infant crying out against something they don't understand, saying, no, I don't want this, without knowing what they actually do want. So here are the kind of different caricatures of the new women that come across at the end of the 19th century. In contrast to the dangerously androgynous new woman or the whiny baby new woman, we see something like um, this poem by Matheson, which gives us a much fairer portrait of what the new woman is. Um, the new woman. She does not languish in her bower or squander all the golden day in fashioning a gaudy flower upon a worsted spray. Nor is she quite content to wait behind her rose wreath lattice pane until beside her father's gate the gallant prince draws rein. The brave new woman scorns to sigh and count it such a grievous thing that year on year should hurry by and no gay suitor bring. In labour's rank she takes her place with skilful hands and cultured mind, not always foremost in the race, but never far behind and not less lightly fall her feet because they tread the busy ways. She is no whit less fair and sweet than maids of olden days, who gowned in samite or brocade looked charming in their dainty guise, but dwelt like violets in the shade with shy half-opened eyes. Of life she takes a clearer view, and through the press serenely moves, unfettered, free, with judgment true, avoiding narrow grooves. She reasons and she understands, and sometimes tis her joy and crown to lift with strong yet tender hands the burdens men lay down. We can see in this poem a really direct uh, contradiction of both the attitudes of Williams and Allen. She suggests that she remains equally as feminine, and she is not unsexed by pursuing intellectual pursuits. She does not shrivel her womb. She is able to be a lady, but also to be out within um, the public sphere. And again, we see her responding to Grant Allen by saying that, of course, she has a clearer view. She does know exactly what she wants. She wants education and she wants employment. She wants economic independence and the ability to move freely outside of the home. We can see all these ideas at play within the yellow wallpaper. Motherhood is central to the story, though the baby never appears, because our narrator is suffering from postnatal depression. Perkins Gilman pushes back against the idea that motherhood was the sole purpose for women, and the idea that women were completely fulfilled once they became mothers. She also makes clear that, in legally and socially declaring the husband to be the head of family, above both wife and children, women are themselves reduced to the state of infants. Under the rescuer, the narrator is just another baby to be cared for, to be fed and cleaned and rocked to sleep. She counters Alan's claim that it is feminism that makes women into whining babies, demonstrating that it is the system of separate spheres and domestic employment that makes women into overgrown children. She also rejects the medical discourses of the period that suggested that women's bodies suffered when the mind was given too much to do. Instead, she gives us a searing portrait of what intellectual deprivation can look like and lead to, showing that both body and mind suffer when women are not given proper stimulus to engage their minds. What women need is to be treated as the fully-fledged adults they are, this story shows, given autonomy over their own bodies and their own minds. Perkins Gilman therefore gives us a story that can be read as a savage indictment of the social and legal situation that entrapped women into the home, and thus a very modern and new version of the female gothic. <laughs>